Okay. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> we acknowledge that the land in which we gather is the traditional unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq First Nation. And I want to welcome uh, Michael Roos, who is our new Director of Integrated Services or inter Integrated Growth. Michael's actually coming from Sydney, Nova Scotia. So he escaped before the, maybe you were caught in the snowstorm over there, were you, Michael? <laughs> um, also, just want to recognize the, didn't do this at the last meeting, but Spud Tournament 2024 was a huge success. It was in the first weekend of February. And I just want to shout out to Ryan Power, Alex, and Curtis Hall. Uh, Roberta McPhee and Lyle Hennessy, who was also awarded the Stewie McFadgen Volunteer of uh, the Tournament Award. So, thank big thanks to them. And there's the Charlottetown Rotary Club. They they've been doing their uh, food basket across the island, and they've already distributed up close to 190 food baskets across the island. So, a great effort on the part part of the the Charlottetown Rotary Club. And just in keeping sp with the spirit of the last meeting, I'm referring to section 37.2 of our procedural bylaw, which governs how we operate. And it regard it's in regards to subsection A, speaking to the question. So the question can be either a report or it could be a, uh, a motion no member shall speak more than twice to the question without a majority of vote of those council members present. Uh, a member shall not speak the, the first time more than five minutes, and then on the second time, three minutes. So again, it's just trying to keep focused in on what we're dealing with, and the question should be pertained to the report or the issue that's on the floor. So I just want to clarify that before we move on. Any declarations of uh, conflict of interest? Councillor Duran is phoning in, so he's on the line. No. Yeah, so, I'm on the line. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So the agenda, I have on the agenda 4A and B. Um, there's a lot of issues related to the resolutions as it pertains to planning and heritage. Do I have someone move the agenda? Moved by Councillor McCabe, second by Councillor Beck. Question? All those in favor? Councillor Duran? In favor. Yeah. And the reason we're not using the, the, the electronic vote, because all members have to be in the chamber. That's the purpose. Did work very fine the last time, so hopefully we'll get to use the next, next meeting. 4A, Public Works. And that is Councillor Julie McCabe. Thank you, Your Worship. And you'll see that we have four resolutions in front of us tonight. Um, I did notice on the Seaview Boulevard reconstruction, the first one, uh, the motion in front of us is to approve staff's recommendation. But I know that there was some discussion at committee level um, where the vote actually came through uh, to. One, I believe, was the vote to uh, his worship had wanted to defer that resolution from coming to the council. I'm going to let Scott speak to that a little bit more clearly. Um, and then if I need to read or re clarify anything after that, I'll stand up again. But um, there are four resolutions. And Eleanor, maybe if we want to start and get them on the floor and we can have some discussion. Thank you. Do you want to read the first one there, Eleanor? Seaview Boulevard Street Reconstruction. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Public Works Committee Resolution Number 1, moved by Councillor McCabe, seconded by Councillor McAleer. Be it resolved that as per the conditions of public tender for Seaview sea View Boulevard Street Reconstruction, the submission of LCL Excavation Incorporated in the amount of $2,437,140 plus all applicable taxes be accepted. 
and that the public works portion of the contract is estimated at $1,518,440 plus all applicable taxes, while the water and sewer utility portion is estimated at $918,700. And further, that the mayor and CAO are hereby authorized to execute standard contracts and agreements to implement this resolution. Councillor Ramsey. Oh, yes, thank you for that, Councillor McCabe. And uh, this has been in the works for a few years now. Is there a carryover from when we funded it last year? Maybe we, I can refer that to the manager, because it was supposed to be done last summer. And I'm just wondering if these funds were carried over to this year. Thank you. I'll let Scott answer that, I'm assuming, I think. Uh, Your Worship, through to uh, the Councillor. Um, yes, yeah, so any funds that were in last or the current fiscal budget um, uh, will be carried forward, or that'll be part of the budget discussion, but that's what the intent is. Questions called? All those in favor, please raise your hand. I, I have my hand up there. Mayor Brown. Oh, good. It, Councillor Duran, I, again, if you could just do me a favor, just text Tracy if you're going to ask for a question. I, I Did you want to ask a question? Yeah, just a clarification. Go ahead. I'm just wondering, uh, has, has the city ever worked with this company before, and, and where is the company uh, located at? Councillor McCabe. I'm going to I'm going to defer that question to the manager. Actually, uh, your worship, through to the uh, councilor draw. Um, no, this is a new contractor to the city. Um, uh, we uh, I believe they're out of New Brunswick um, is where they're out of. Um, There's their home base, uh, but I believe they have uh, ventured over to PEI this year, and I believe they already have some work lined up in the western part of the province as well. Councillor Twill. Thank you. Uh, uh, Councillor Duran, did you want to follow up? No, I, I just, uh, like I said, I, I, I never heard of this company before, so I'm just wondering, you know, if they did work here in the city or surrounding area. I just never heard of it, so I just want clarification. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Councillor Twill. So this is uh, a construction firm from Moncton, New Brunswick, as you pointed out. Uh, Mr. Adams, I noticed that there's three other bidders. I, all, I believe they're all island firms. If they're all island firms, um, was there no appetite to see what could be accomplished in terms of uh, awarding this to an island construction firm? Uh, that was one of the issues that came up at our last Public Works Committee meeting, this issue and, and the one the one that's about to follow. And as, as most of the members of council know, for the last year I've been advocating for uh, the procedural bylaw. I'm not sure Procure what. <coughs> procurement. Procurement. Yeah. yeah, procurement. Okay, great. Procurement policy. bylaw. Policy. No, bylaw, we not policy. We haven't, approved the po we haven't approved the bylaw yet. That's right. That's what I'm saying. I've been advocating yeah. for the bylaw. I'm not quite so sure why it's taken. It's, it's been a year now since I've been advocating promoting the bylaw. I'm not so sure why it's taken this long, because in the proposed bylaw, I understand that there's going to be points awarded if, in fact, you're an island firm. So in the spirit of promoting and shopping local and promoting our, our, our local, uh, local construction firms here in the province, I'm, I'm at a loss as to why. Um, we didn't see fit to come in with a recommendation to support an, an island firm, construction firm that is. So um, never before have we uh, engaged with this particular construction firm. So of all the I's and all the T's been cr crossed, Scott? Could you, could you forward that question, Councillor, Councillor McCabe, do you want to defer it? Partly. I just want to remind people that we do have a procurement policy that we have to follow right now. And until we do change and have our procurement bylaw in place, our job is to be responsible to the taxpayers of Charlottetown. They met the requirements on the tender bid. It's the lowest bid. 
There is no bonus points right now until we come back with our procurement by bylaw for our island firms. I'm looking forward to that happening too. So I'll, I can defer it for Scott. I'm sure the manager's not going to have a whole lot more to add, but you can if you Mr. Feel. Chief Engineer Scott. Uh, Your Worship, through the Councillor Tweel. So when we review these tenders, uh, we don't look at where they're from. Um, uh, legislation and, prevent and federal laws um, state that we have to be fair and transparent and open to various contractors to bid on our work. So it's a fair uh, process uh, for anyone that is bidding on our work. Um, in regards to this contractor, even though they're new, uh, we do ask around uh, to see uh, if the, any uh, other jurisdictions had any issues with them. Uh, we haven't found any anything any reason to believe that they can't do the work. They are a licensed contractor and meet all the obligations as per the tender documents. Uh, so that's why we recommend to award. Councillor Twill. Again, I'll reiterate, that's why I was promoting the uh, procurement bylaw, because it would um, allow for our island construction firms uh, points uh, when it comes to the rating system to be, you know, as, as to what the formula would be in terms of being awarded, awarded the contract. I think it's unfortunate that we don't have that bylaw in place to deal with the issues of this magnitude and the one that's going to follow. So uh, I'm somewhat troubled by that considering there was other firms that applied and in the spirit of supporting local, that's, that's, what, that's where I'll be going. Okay. okay. Oh, Mr. Forbes, uh, legal counsel for the city of Charlottetown. Mr. Forbes. I just wanted to comment because I think it might be helpful for counsel on that issue to be aware that, that um, gosh, I'm just so used to standing up. It's my acting days. <laughs> well, you still have to stand up. Uh, I just thought it'd be helpful to comment that um, it, there are restrictions on what a municipal organization can do in terms of in, impl implicating local preference bids into their their procurement issues. So there is a threshold under the Canadian Free Trade Agreement. That's two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Quite a number of years ago, subject to inflation, so it's about three hundred thirty thousand dollars now. So, you know, a project like this project that you're looking at, that's you know over that threshold, would not be the type of project that you'd be able to introduce a local preference requirement into that tender. So it would only be lower value construction projects, goods and services projects that you'd be able to have a local preference for in, in terms of any procurement bylaw or considerations of council. Thank you, Mr. Forbes. Mr. Gaspar Bernard. No, actually, he just answered it. Okay. 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 Questions called. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Councillor Drawn, yay or nay? No. Councillor Twill. Nay, A2. Okay, do you want to go to the next one? CAO Eleanor. Thank you, Your Worship. Public Works Committee Resolution Number 2, moved by Councillor McCabe, seconded by Councillor McAleer. Be it resolved that as per the conditions of the public tender for street rehabilitation, Eastern Gateway Phase 2, the submission of Birch Hill Construction Limited in the amount of $8,327,136 plus all applicable taxes be accepted. And that the public works portion of the contract is estimated at $7,894,436 uh, plus all applicable taxes while the water and sewer utility portion is estimated at $432,700 plus all applicable taxes. And further, that the mayor and CAO are hereby authorized to execute standard contracts and agreements to implement this resolution. Nope. There's uh, Councillor McCabe. Councillor McCabe. This is the uh, tender that I was speaking of, not the first one, and I apologize for that. But the committee recommendation recommendation is different from the staff recommendation here, and I guess. Um, just to point out, it was very clearly outlined to the committee um, that this tendering process was vetted through staff, it was vetted through the engineering consultants that are going to do the work, and it's been vetted through legal to determine that the disqualification was actually valid. 
So I just want to make sure that you're aware, Scott will be able to answer any more questions uh, based on that. I know we all want to be able to support local. We all want to be able to, um, especially when we're talking eight and nine million dollar projects, but there is processes in place. We've already been down a road where we've learned that we haven't always followed our process and we end up coming back full circle and getting ourselves in, into some hot water on that. This was done right according to the experts who do the tendering process, so I just want to make sure that everybody's clear on that. So just to clarify, Eleanor, there was a deferral from the committee, but the deferral's not in the resolution. Can you clarify? Well, thank you, Worship. So there was a recommended deferral to council from the committee. But what's in the resolution was what staff's initial recommendation was. So council can choose to um, go with what committee has recommended, in which case council would be deferring a decision on this. If you would defer a decision, though, you need to be specific about what you're looking for in order to defer that decision. Councilor Doyle. And then I get Councilor Duran. Yeah, so, so the, the resolution is to approve the tender, correct? Okay, so we had a committee meeting, and the committee meeting, uh, it was a split vote. It was 2-1 to defer. So now we have a resolution here to approve. So I'm not sure why we had a committee meeting. Well, having said that, I think the concern me was, and, and I asked the relevant questions, did it meet the guidelines, procedures, from a public works perspective? Managers said yes, both from an engineering, internally, externally, uh, followed legal counsel. Manager uh, made that quite clear, it did. But here's where, I'm, here's where I'm having trouble. Mayor of the city moved the deferral. Uh, prior to the standing committee of public works meeting, there was a, a meeting held, uh, the mayor, CAO, manager, plus I think the island firm, to uh, review or to analyze and assess why the island construction firm was disqualified. I, I had grave concerns because as a member of the standing committee, I felt it appropriate that all members of the standing committee should have been there to hear the concerns. I classified that as an appeal, uh, even though we don't have an appeal mechanism. Nonetheless, the mere fact the meeting took place, to my mind, was an appeal. Cut the cards whatever way you want, that was an appeal. So uh, suffice it to say, I couldn't get the information. I would really like to know why the only construction firm was disqualified. I, I, I'd like to know that. So when it came to my, the original vote, my vote was to abstain to abstain because I felt quite clearly I didn't have enough information. You're going to vote to make an informed decision of an $8 million expenditure. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money, and I want to be able to make an informed decision. But I was told, it was clarified later, that uh, under the MGA, one of the many deficiencies of the MGA, you, you, can't, uh, you can't abstain. If you do abstain, it's in the affirmative. That's something we have to look at. But nonetheless, um, so I said no, because I'm, I'm not really sure about the process. Okay? With all due respect to the mayor, the mayor and senior management are total ops, opposite ends of the spectrum on an $8 million expenditure. So I, I want to know why. Why was this, this firm, an island firm, disqualified? I believe I have, as a member of the committee, and I believe all members of the council have a right to know why this firm was disqualified. So again, to, 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 to reinforce the facts so I can make an informed decision. That didn't happen, folks. So I'm troubled that it's here as, as a recommending approval when there was deferral recommended to the to, to council and now this. So uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I cannot support this going forward for a variety of reasons. I want to be able to make an informed decision, and, and quite candidly, I don't believe that I can make an informed decision. Thank you, sir. 
I just uh, I want to get Councillor Drawn because I don't want to forget. Councillor Drawn, can you go there? Then Councillor Bernard, then Councillor Thank Bernard. you, Mayor Brown. And, go. and I, I'm the same uh, listening to uh, Councillor Tweel. Um, it says it disqualified, but there's no backgrounder on it, uh, why they were disqualified. And I believe uh, they were a lower bid uh, as well. So I, too, am looking for that information before I vote uh, of why they were disqualified. I mean, there's no backgrounder here of, of why it was. So, again, how can you make an informed decision on this magnitude of, of a resolution if you don't know the reasons why? So I'd like to know that before before I can vote for this. Thank you. Councilor McCabe, did you want to address that or do you want to defer to the engineer? What's your preference? Yeah, I'm going to let uh, the manager answer that question. Uh, Chief your, Engineer. Your Worship, I wonder Scott. if maybe Mr. Forbes... Um, you want him to answer? Yeah, I think he would be best suited to answer this. Uh, what, the legal side the, or the, the, the bidding he side? Was, he was part of the decision making oh. on the disqualification. He oh. was our legal counsel that uh, provided us the, uh, with his opinion. Um, so I'll let him speak to it uh, to ensure that he says what he can in, in a public uh, session. Mr. Mr. Forbes. Sure. So first, it's important to remember that the, the entire tender process, and this is the case, you know, nationwide and everywhere, that it's intended to be an open and transparent process. And the idea behind doing that is to create fairness to all of the bidders. Fairness is the is the utmost consideration. Um, so part of that fairness is if a bid doesn't comply with the term set out in the tender, then it's a non-compliant bid and it's disqualified. One of the key terms, and it was expressed in very strong language in the city's tender, was that the substantial completion date for this project was August 16th. Now, although there was a signature on that form from the disqualified bidder, they appended to their bid a schedule that included a bunch of completion dates that were well past that August 16th completion date. In other words, they, they, were, non they were a non-compliant bidder because they were not going to meet the construction schedule, at least on the basis of the schedule that they provided. So as between a non-compliant bidder and a compliant bidder with only two bidders, there was only one compliant bidder remaining. Did you want to add to that, Mr. Adams? And then just one thing to add to Mr. Forbes, too. We also have to keep in mind that there are some bidders that will look at a tender, pull a tender, and may not put a bid in because of the parameters that are in there because it's too challenging to, for them to meet it, too. So that's part of the open and fair transparency side of things that uh, we got to be upfront and open uh, right from day one so that everyone, whether it's a, an actual, uh, someone that actually puts in a tender or a bid, sorry, or someone that is considering a bid, they're all playing by the same uh, playing on the playing on the same playing field. Thank you, Councilor Tart. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I too was confused in reading their package as to dis disqualified. That was the only um, description of what would occurred. So I was prepared not to support based on the fact that I didn't know background on what that was. So I appreciate. Uh, it was Mr. Forbes uh, to uh, provide that. It clearly did not meet the guidelines and under the conditions of the Procurement Act. And um, I think maybe the lesson of this is why could that not have been part of the package? It seemed to be very open about what that was and it may have taken away some of the uncertainty of what disqualified meant. Because that was my direct question that uh, Councillor Duran had asked. I was going to ask the exact same question and maybe others were wondering the same thing. So thank you. Councillor Bernard. Thank you, Your Worship. And I think the lawyer answered it. I, I guess uh, it looks here when you read, there's, there's, there's only been two bidders. One was disqualified. I understand that legal had, uh, had ruled on that. Um, so I, I'm not sure why we want to defer. It's, 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 it's pretty clear. I think legal is here to keep us out of trouble and out of the courts. So um, I think he explained it very well. I guess that was the question I had was, if there's only two bid and one's disqualified and legal reviewed it and said it was non-compliant, then I'm not sure why we want to defer. So, thank you. Councillor Duran, I know you sent in a text. Can you speak up there? Councillor Duran? Yes, thank you, Mayor Brown. I'm just wondering, um, two, two types of uh, questions here. It, it doesn't say in the background or here, is, is there funding you know, involved in this, or are we doing it all ourselves? Um, that that was one of my questions, and the other question was, 
you know, who who put the timeline restrictions on that? Would that be, you know, our public works department? And what happens if it's not done by a specific date? Like if, if this company or, you know, I think it's an off-island company, if, if all of a sudden they can't do it in that timeline uh, and it's delayed, is there penalties involved uh, with that? Thank you. Councillor Dron, could you repeat, what was the first question? Uh, the the yeah, funding. Yeah, okay. The funding, like I, I don't see it. Is it is it three levels of government on this funding? Yeah. It's a major project, so I, I just don't see it there. Okay. So, so there's two two points to the question. Thank you, Councillor McCabe. You want to defer it? Okay. Chief Engineer. Uh, your worship through the council drown so for the first one funding yes there's isa funding on the entirety of the eastern gateway project uh so the phase one and phase two um it's just over three million right now we have made a request for them to reconsider to uh, see if there is additional funds available to help us with these costs because when we made that application a number of years ago uh, the costs have significantly gone up um, so that request has been in and they are uh, considering that at the moment the other thing, uh, I believe, uh, the timeline. So the timeline, yes, uh, was put in. Uh, uh, it was a decision made between my uh, my team and I. Uh, and the reason why for that timeline is the event grounds has a major event in September. So we wanted to, uh, that was one of the biggest concerns we heard from a number of individuals when we had the public meetings, was the Shellfish Festival that uses this uh, event grounds every year. Uh, and we made, uh, made it very clear to, to the Shellfish Festival uh, board uh, that we would do everything to uh, ensure that, um, um, that uh, the work was done and we were out of there uh, in time for them to get their tent and, and the site set up and ready to go. The other key piece is we're trying to get ahead of the pro provincial government as they are planning a uh, road work at the intersection of Riverside Drive and Grafton. And they can't start the work until our work is done just because of how significant uh, their work is and the phasing and all that and all that, those types of things. So that's where that August, middle of August date came in. Uh, from a uh, penalty lot wise, we, are, we do have liquidated damages. So um, if uh, there are delays beyond that uh, 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 August 16th dates, um, you know, we also have to factor in there are delays because of weather and things like that. Uh, but if there are re uh, unreasonable delays uh, because of the contractor, we can go after them for liquidated damages, whether we have to um, hire a contractor to help the shellfish out to put up their tent for some reason or additional cleaning, whatever that is as a result of this, um, uh, as a result of the work being completed. Those are things that we can um, uh, uh, apply to the contractor beyond the state. Councilor Twill. Thank you. Um, so once again, I'll, I'll restate uh, my major concerns with the process. A subsequent meeting had taken place prior to the standing committee meeting. That meeting was senior management and the mayor of the city, both at opposite ends of the spectrum, about the disqualification. I understand there was emails exchanged, there was information exchanged, and as a member of the committee, we should have been given the opportunity to sit down and to review those concerns as well. I appreciate the solicitor standing up here tonight, but as a member of the committee, that information should have been forthcoming uh, you know, at, at the same time, simultaneously, that didn't happen. So to my mind, it's very dysfunctional. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know. Um, the sooner we get this uh, bylaw for procurement, uh, the better. Because there's got there's got to be there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way to deal with issues of this magnitude. This is an eight million dollar expenditure. Okay, question. Questions call. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay. Councilor Strong, yay or nay? Nay. Councilor Twill, yay or nay? No. Yay. Nay. Okay. Okay, we've got another. Public Works Committee Resolution Number 3, moved by Councilor McCabe, seconded by Councilor uh, McClear. <coughs> 
Be it resolved that as for the conditions of the public tender for a 2024 full-size three-row SUV 4x4, the submission of Fair Isle Ford, Charlottetown in the amount of $84,900 plus all applicable taxes be accepted, and that the mayor and CAO are hereby authorized to execute standard contracts and agreements to implement this resolution. Councillor McTarrett and then Councillor Twill. Uh, thank you, Worship. Just in reviewing this, I'm, I'm wondering, and maybe this is a question to uh, the chair of the committee, because this is a police vehicle, I believe. Um, what is the purpose? I, I, I struggle to understand uh, uh, Ford Expedition three, you know, uh, three row vehicle. Um, what practical use or is this vehicle going intended to be used for? And maybe that's to the chair of uh, Public Works. I, I don't know who's. Yep. Thank you, <laughs> Councillor Twill. <laughs> and we've asked Council, for Councillor Matard. Or Matard. Yeah. Sorry, whatever. Councillor Twill, si <laughs> Council Twill sits there, next to you. He sits next to you. Um, sorry, Councillor Matard. Um, we have asked at our committee. So Public Works oversees fleet management, but it's kind of a separate little in entity in its own. So we need to be a little bit more briefed and updated, and we've asked for that for our next committee, is to have that information come forward. Um, so this is a police vehicle. I think the best person to ask why they need a three-seat vehicle would be the police. But I don't, unless Scott, do you know why they need a three-seat seat vehicle? Chief Engineer. Your Worship, your worship through to Councillor Matar. Um, it's about space. Um, so it's the IDENT team. So these are the folks that are going into crime scenes, uh, taking, gathering evidence. Uh, so there's a lot of equipment and material that they need to take with them um, in order to uh, attend scenes of crimes and things like that. So that's, that's the main reason, uh, my understanding, is because of the space they require for this type of work. You good? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Paul, and I appreciate the explanation. I think that's just really what misses is missing sometimes. And we're looking at an eighty-four thousand dollars expenditure on a Ford Expedition for the just you know again, very sounds very logical. Found sounds reasonable for what it's used for. It's just not always always in the context of that. So uh, appreciate uh, the explanation. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Twill. Other question? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Um, at the committee level, I had asked a question. Uh, regarding the purchase of this vehicle, because council, uh, I think it might have been a couple of months ago, purchased eight vehicles for uh, protective services. And I asked what the formula was in terms of how many vehicles are required for the Charlottetown Police Department. And I think it was stated at the time that um, they were going to consult with fleet management or, 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 or the senior management of the police department and, and get back to uh, the P Public Works Committee as to how many vehicles are actually required. You know, if we have 60 police officers, how many police officers are, are, are or how many vehicles are, are truly required uh, to be able to effectively police the city of Charlottetown? Um, I'm still waiting for that information. I'm going to support the resolution. But I think it's prudent. I think it's prudent that we have that information. I'd like to, you know, I keep reading about uh, in the newspaper about uh, different, uh, diff different initiatives being pursued by the Protective Services Committee, I, I'm trying to understand the rationale and the logic for a lot of these uh, initiatives coming forward as to see you know, why we need so many vehicles, or is it 10 vehicles, is it 15 vehicles? How many is it? So I'd like to get a handle on that. Point. And Councillor um, Ramsey, it'd be no problem for the Council from Ward 4 to come to your Standing Committee for Protection Services and protection and, and emergency services, right? And I was talking to the chief over that too. Uh, some of these are being replaced, vehicles, and uh, some are in the tender, I think, the last year or so, Scott, they're a year behind along that line. So it's the same question I had too, Councillor Twill, like, like how many more vehicles do we need? Yeah. But I, at the same time, like some of these are being replaced for the ones that are out of service as of now. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Council McCabe. Yeah, Council McCabe. And I okay. agree that this is really important information for us all to have coming into perfect time at budget time. If there's yeah. going to be new asks, we need to have that information, and we need to, you know, it needs to be justified why we're spending this money. This one was approved in our 2023-2024 budget, so that's why it's before us tonight. Councilor Duran. Thank you. Um, I, I too have concerns. I mean, 
I understand they need a new vehicle. We went out to tender. There was only one bidder. Um, I'm wondering, you know, if, if we can go out to tender again, uh, the possibility. I mean, this is a ninety-seven and a half thousand dollar expenditure when you put the eighty-three in tax on it. Um, you know, do they have to have this? You know, could they get something else? Could you redo what you're asking for? I mean, this this is close to $100,000 for one vehicle. So, you know, I, I have major concerns the way the money's going. So I, I just, uh, you know, I that's all I can say about it. And I guess I just can't support it. Thank you. Councilor McCabe. I'm, I'm excited to see that we're starting to pay attention and ask questions about where we're spending the money for sure for the city. But again, this was already approved in our 2023-2024 budget. So, you know, it's not about going back to tender or going out to look. And I do think the question was asked about Ford and it, it, their specialized vehicle, if I'm right, Scott, and you can clarify that. But I, I don't think it's a vehicle that can just come from anywhere. Anyway, I'll let Scott respond. Chief Engineer. Uh, Your Worship, through the Councillor. Um, so yes, if there's a police package specific that for the vehicle, then yes, there's only so many manufacturers that will do that. Uh, I'm not sure if this one has the police package or if it was just solely a, uh, we were looking for a third row um, SUV. Um, at the time, like I say, uh, uh, as we talk about tenders, we put it out there on, on our website and it gets put up to other places and any uh, vendor Across the island, across the country, can bid on these, um, and um, and un unfortunately, we only had one. You know, it, it's not, not great for competition, but we had one, and that's our public and open process. And one can meet their deadlines and, and meet the specs, uh, and that's what the market dic is dictating right now is the price, um, and and so that's where we're at with this. Question. Okay, questions called, and it's a local bid from Fair Isle Ford. All those in favor, please put up your hand. Okay, Councillor Drawn, yay or nay? No, thank you. Thank you. Okay, is that it, Councillor uh, Okay, It is. Oh, an easement on city right of way for maritime electric EV chargers. Mm. Thank you, Worship. Public Works Committee Resolution Number Four, moved by Councillor McCabe, seconded by Councillor McLean. Whereas the city had previously entered in a cost entered into a cost sharing agreement with Maritime Electric Company Limited to install an electric vehicle charging station within the public right-of-way on Kent Street at or near PID 3566 adjacent to City Hall. And whereas MECL is required to have a signed encroachment agreement with the city as a requirement of their federal funding agreement. Be it resolved that council agrees to enter into an encroachment agreement with MECL for the electric vehicle charging station installed within the right-of-way on Kent Street. And further, that the mayor and CAO are hereby authorized to execute standard contracts and agreements to implement this resolution. Okay, Councilor Twill. I had asked the question regarding the uh, formula at the public works meeting, and I'm just wondering if it's consistent with other jurisdictions across Atlantic Canada, or maybe across Atlantic Canada, or, or across the country. Um, I'm not sure if the manager had an opportunity to look at that, to look at this formula that we're entering into with Maritime Electric to see if there is consistency with other municipalities and just wonder if you had an opportunity to, uh, to research that information. Thank you. Councilman Gabe. I'm certainly going to let the manager speak, but I'm considering we just met last week. I'm sure the answer to the question, if he had time to do a jurisdictional scan about what other jurisdictions are doing, the answer is going to be no. And I know that you are, we already kind of had this discussion around the fact that, um, you know, with our commitment to the sustainability world and where we were going, that this was just more for information. We've already went into the agreement as far as the charger stations go. This is to make sure that it's kind of more legalized. But I will allow you to yet again explain why this is here. He's a pretty good researcher, <laughs> Chief Engineer. He is, but not sure. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 he's good. 
Chief Engineer. Your Worship, through to Councillor Tweel. Uh, so no, unfortunately, I have not had a chance to look at what other jurisdictions do across Canada, and, and Atlantic Canada in particular, in terms of these on-street metering or charging stations. I'm not sure if there are a lot around uh, with the municipality um, uh, and the utility agreement. I'm not sure. I haven't seen many in my travels, but not saying that there isn't some out there. Um, this was a bit of a unique process, and I give a, just a brief history on it. Um, Maritime and Electric was uh, there was a, there was federal funding available back in 2019, I believe, for charging stations. There was a big push for federal government to um, uh, see some funds be spread around the country for level two charging stations to be installed for public use. Um, Maritime Electric got involved at the time because there's a lot of small municipalities around um, PEI that. It was, uh, there was a threshold for how many you had to buy and most of them only could afford one or two or only needed one or two in their municipalities. So what Maritime Electric did said they would take, um, bring all the municipalities in, whether it was uh, Charlottetown or some of the smaller municipalities around um, the island and kind of lead the charge in putting a larger package together, make it more appealing to the feds uh, to be able to get funding which it worked. Um, we were able to get a lot of funding. The province at the time wasn't, did not have a funding program, but they did kick in quite a bit of money. Um, and uh, it was very, very low cost to the city. And I think we installed something like, uh, uh, I want to say it was like 18 around. Whether 19. 19. Um, in parkades, on the city right away, at some of our municipal buildings. So it was a very, very great process to it. Uh, because Maritime Electric is involved, they're the owners of the infrastructure. Um, and uh, how, how it works is the user fee, um, the individual pays to charge it, uh, charge their car. It's supposed to be cost neutral to everyone. Uh, there's a small surcharge for Maritime Electric to maintain the uh, facility. Um, the, the meters are, the charging, or the electricity comes from a local meter. So if it's uh, outside here at Kent Street, it is coming off the City Hall meter, but uh, we get reimbursed for our utility costs as a result of that. So the zero cost to the city at the end of the day. Um, and it was a great initiative and everyone was uh, very excited at the time. Uh, I think it was a unanimous decision when it was voted on. Um, again, this is just a, uh, a house cleaning item uh, just to get this in uh, just formally approved so that uh, they can uh, close out their file with the federal funding um, lender. Thank you, Scott. Um, I was motivated to ask the question because we have member of many private utilities like Maritime Electrics that are using the cities right away uh, for monetary purposes, and we don't recoup any, any, of, those, uh, any of those funds. And that's why I keep bringing back to a jurisdictional scan. And I, Scott, you know, I've been on the record talking about this previously. So I, I'm hoping that uh, we can come back at a later date again, maybe with a policy or a bylaw, so that the city of Charlottetown can recoup the cost. This is the city's right of way. And I want to make sure that we're getting the best bang for our buck. Uh, they're, they're in the profit business. We're in the cost neutral business. So. Uh, I, I wanted to bring that to your attention, hoping for, hoping that uh, down the road we can be proactive and, and again, doing, doing what other jurisdictions are doing as well. Thank you. Thank you. And I agree with you, Councilor Twill. Do the scan and see what's out there and best practices are available. And you can bring it up to the next Standing Committee for Public Works. Follow up on it. Okay. Question? Questions, Kyle. Okay. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Council Drawn, yay or nay? In favor. Okay, 10 0. Okay, that's your report, uh, Council McCabe. Thank you there, Chief Engineer uh, Scott uh, Adams. We're now moving on to planning heritage. I, we have David Gundrum and Donna Miller Ayton, our esteemed managers from planning and development. So, do you want to start off, uh, Madam Chair, Deputy Mayor Lanny Aikoff? Thank you. Yep. Um, yeah, thank you, everybody. So we have um, six resolutions this evening. Three of them are to uh, proceed to public consultation. And you'll notice that there is one that indicates that we are going to be discussing some housekeeping issues. But that's actually um, um, a mistake in our agenda. We're actually um, looking at the, the, sixth, the sixth resolution is a proposal um, for the phasing plan of the official plan resolution. So you can cross off the um, housekeeping amendments. They're not on today's agenda. And um, 
once the resolutions are on the floor, I can do my best to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, do you want to put the first one on? Which is major variance. Thank you, Worship. Planning and Heritage, resolution number one, moved by Deputy Mary Ankoff, seconded uh, by Councillor McCabe. Sorry, I've got arrows pointing in directions on my resolution here. Be it resolved that the major variance uh, for the unaddressed parcel, PID 387407, adjacent to 300 Capital Drive to increase the maximum permitted height for a proposed hotel building in the C2 zone from 12 meters, 39.4 feet, to an average maximum permitted height of 19.96 meters, 65.5 uh, feet, in order to allow for a six-story hotel building on the subject property be approved. Okay, Councillor Twill. No, you're not there. Well, you there? Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I just want to, uh, to say that I think this is a great news story for the city of Charlottetown to have a hotel, another hotel being constructed in our city. I think it's going to be great for tourism. Now, I wish the developer all the best. Councilor Gron, are you okay? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you for asking. Question? Questions, Questions called? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Councillor Drawn, yay or nay? In favor. Okay, 10 0. Want to read the next one there? Planning and Heritage Resolution Number 2, moved by Deputy Mary Ankoff, seconded by Councillor McCabe. Be it resolved that the request for a site specific exemption to the Zoning and Development Bylaw, an amendment to the official plan for the property located at 199 Grafton Street, <coughs> 156 Street, uh, Prince Street, PID 342790 be approved to proceed to public consultation. Questions called. All those in favor, please raise your hand. <coughs> Councilor Drought. <coughs> in favor. Okay, 10 0. Next one, please. Planning and resolution, uh, planning and heritage resolution number three, moved by Deputy Mayor Yankoff, seconded by Councilor McCabe. Be it resolved that the zoning bylaw amendment and official plan amendment requests that pertain to unaddressed properties, PIDs 192252 and 422642, which propose future development of a master plan community on the subject properties that would include a total range of 1,211 to 1,476 dwelling units, including a mix of single detached, duplex, townhome, and multi-unit residential dwellings, be approved to proceed to public consultation. Councilor Bernard. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Your Worship, and I've and I seen this proposal. The, the province has had a couple of meetings on this in the community. Um, I'm just wondering, and I know it's going to a public consultation through the, the zoning changes, but there's some good comments received here from the city departments and some external agencies. Uh, especially page 6 of 16, where it talks about Hunters Lane, Northridge Parkway, Acadian Drive, some upgrades that are going to need to be done to handle the traffic. Uh, but there's no discussion on cost sharing with the province. There's no arrangements being made. I'm just wondering, um, if I don't bring it up now, I'm just wondering, when does that conversation happen with the province of looking to have these streets upgraded? Because if we continue to get on the road, we have our public meetings and everything's good and it gets passed and they go ahead and they build and Nothing's ever upgraded. So I'm just wondering when those recommendations occur. If anybody can answer that or when the conversation can start. Councilor Bernard, this is a, a development long and waiting. I know the previous government worked at it and mulled over it for four years. This government has taken action. And yeah, it's going like anywhere between 1,200 and 1,500 dwelling units. I think it's 84 acres, is that correct? 85. 85 acres. Um, yeah, this is a big deal, and I think this is good for the city. And how will it play into our infrastructure is what be, is being asked by the FCM, is that the feds and the provinces have to kick in more money for infrastructure. If we continue to incre increase our density or housing, uh, 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 housing numbers. So yeah, Eleanor, can you, CAO Eleanor, can you provide 
some light at the end of the tunnel for his concern about upgrades to infrastructure that will be impacted by the increased number of dwellings within the Hillsborough Park area? I think you worship. I think it might be best for planning to speak about this. This is, although it, I will add, um, it's not something you you would prevent from going to a public meeting about like this. This no. will happen throughout the approval process to get the appropriate conditions in place. But I'll defer to Planning and Heritage. Thank you, Mr. Gundrum or Don or would either one. Sure, I don't mind fielding feel it, uh, Your Worship. Uh, so through the chair uh, to answer Councillor Bernard's question or try to answer it, um, uh, we're not at the stage yet where staff are formulating a recommendation on the proposal. That's yet to come. Uh, there could be conditions attached to that recommendation that speak to such things as cost sharing. Um, but however, I will say that this development is, is of such a scope and scale that it would require a development agreement between the developer and the city of Charlottetown. And uh, part and parcel with that agreement, there could be uh, clauses that speak to this sort of thing with that agreement, which would come after any approval by council for uh, the zoning change and the OP uh, amendment that's being proposed. So. Donna, you're okay with that? So second time, Councilor Bernard, just want to make sure you know. Yep. Boy. Okay, no, and, and that's fine. It's, it's, it's PI Housing Authority that owns it. And, we, and like you say, we've been talking about it for a while. and, and I, I'm glad to hear that some clauses can be added in just as long as they don't get forgotten. And just to give you an example, I'm just going to read the, the sentence. Um, they're talking about one of the three streets at Hunter's Land. The street is currently quite narrow, with it, and with the increased traffic expected to development appears to be roughly 3.5 times current. With full development scenario, upgrades will be necessary. Considerations should be given to how this is funded. Upgrades should be done as part of phase one. So I just don't want it forgotten. These recommendations make a lot of sense. This is a big subdivision. Um, and like I said, I know there's been a lot of work gone into it. I know it's, it's housing that's well needed. And I know this, this again, is a five to, five to ten year project, apparently. So I just don't want to get that missed. So um, yeah, if the planning can keep an eye on that, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ron, is he on? Tracy? Yes, no. No, good. Questions called. All those in favor? Please raise your hand. Councillor Drawn, yay or nay? In favor. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next one. Yep, go ahead. Planning and Heritage uh, Committee Resolution Number Four, moved by Deputy Mary Yankoff, seconded by Councillor McCabe. Be it resolved that the zoning bylaw amendment and official plan amendment requests that pertain to uh, 503 University Avenue, PID 374140, in the order to allow for the future development of a proposed eight story, stepping back to six story, 257 unit residential apartment building on the subject property be approved to proceed to public consultation. This is another big deal, and I'm glad that Trevor McLeod and Mike Tweeler here from the Gray Groups to watch the vote. Um, very, very pleased to see it go ahead. And uh, Councilor Ramsey called the question. I was only halfway through my sentence. <laughs> All those in favor, please raise your hand. Councilor Duran, yay or nay? In favor. Okay, 10 0. Oh, yeah. Okay. Next resolution. Thank you, Your Worship. Planning and Heritage Resolution Number Five, I believe, uh, moved by Deputy Mayor Yankoff, seconded by Councillor McCabe. Be it resolved that the request to amend the development concept plan and development agreement pertaining to Lot uh, 2019-3 of 20 St. Martha's Court be approved. Questions called. Well, they want to take your lead, Councillor Kevo Ramsey. <laughs> All those in favor, raise your hand. <laughs> Councilor Drawn, yay or nay? In favor. Okay. Next one, please. Thank you, Richard. For the next one, we're actually going to pull it from the agenda because procedurally it wasn't included on uh, the agenda that was advertised, and we just have a resolution standing by itself without a council report. So we will bring it back to the next council meeting for your consideration with all the information. Thank you, and I apologize for that. 
Okay, thank you. So we're on agenda number five. Motion to move into a closed session as per, as per the Municipal Government Act of Prince Edward Island. A, personal information about an identifiable, identifiable individual including a municipal employee or an employee of a control corporation key to the city nominee, section 119, subsection 1C. B, matter shall under, consider, under consideration on which the council has not yet publicly announced a decision and about with which dis discussion in public would likely prejudice a municipality's ability to carry out its negotiations. Funding agreement, section 119, subsection 1E. C, the conduct of an investigation under uh, or enforcement of the act or below, code of conduct, code of co council code of conduct bylaw matter. Section 119, subsection 1G, and business arising from the closed session, one anticipated public works resolution, resolution funding agreement attached. Moved by Councillor Ramsey, seconded by Councillor Matard. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Councillor Drawn. In favor. Okay. So.
called order, declarations of conflict of interest. We've gone through that. There's only one item on the agenda, and that is the ICF Hurricane Fiona Recovery Fund contribution. Correct? We have a resolution for that? Okay. Can you read the resolution? Uh, thank you, Worship. Moved by Councillor McCabe, seconded by Councillor uh, McLear. Be it resolved that Council enter into a contribution agreement for federal funding for a project that will be announced in the near future, and that the Mayor and CAO are hereby authorized to execute standard contracts and agreements to implement this resolution. No, Councillor Twill had his hand up. Councillor Twill, on the motion. Okay. Uh, when this was discussed at the Public Works Committee meeting, I looked at it, and I support the idea of, of funding and, and, and lobbying the other levels of government for, for, for generators, for community. My, my ward, uh, I feel there's a real disparity because I don't see any warming centers. I don't see anything uh, that, uh, that will meet the needs, for example, uh, if you look at the demographics, like uh, we have a heavy concentration of senior citizens that live, uh, you know, places like Devar Court, uh, Queens Court, uh, Champion Court, and what I learned from uh, Fiona was yes, we had a warm-up center down Confederation Center and other parts of the city, but we missed a wide, a wide range of our population because they didn't have the opportunity. And some of, some of the seniors and some of the residents in this community were without power for about 16, 17, 18 days, and even longer. So, Scott, as you know, I brought this up, and uh, we have to still, I think this is a great step forward, but there's still work to do to address the discrepancies and the disparities in terms of providing warm-up shelters where people have that opportunity to uh, get warm, maybe have a shower, have a coffee, a sandwich, whatever the case may be. So it's a great starting point, but we still got a long way to go to deal with the disparities. Councilor McCabe. Thank you, and, and just to, to update the rest of council on the discussion there, it was clarified at that time too that Public Works is responsible for our own municipal buildings. That's why this resolution's here tonight. Councillor Tweel's absolutely right. And maybe that would go through EMO, or maybe that could come back to strategic governmental intergovernmental affairs where you're working with community organizations such as the Jack Blanchard Center or different places to help connect them to some of these programs. Uh, I think all that was required was a letter from the fire department to say that they would agree in supporting this as a warming center. But as for tonight, these resolutions that are here are only here because Public Works is responsible for our own municipal buildings. Thank you. Yeah, Councilor Twill, yeah, just as a follow-up to our Public Works meeting, I went to uh, the Kirk of St. James. They plan to apply through EMO for a, a generator, but they need recognition from our fire services. And I think we can do the same thing with the uh, Holy Redeemer, the Jack Blanchard Hall. So that your advice, your your knowledge is, is being adhered or taken into taken under consideration. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, you know, and I think that's great. Kirk of St. James, I was there at uh, Sterling Peterson's funeral. Grew up in the same neighborhood. And, and, and I appreciate the uh, the initiative being pursued by the Kirk of St. James. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I'm, going to be, I'm, I'm going to be relentless. We, we missed a, a wide demographic, a section of our city, high density area, that was not looked after during Fiona. So I got to do my due diligence and bring, ev use every opportunity, every vehicle possible to make sure we start to make inroads to, again, to address that disparity. Thank you. Okay. Question? Question's called. Okay. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Councillor Drawn. In favor. He said yes? Okay. 10-0. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Who moved? Who second?